Well, good morning. How is everybody? Making it? Warm-ish? Welcome to the 8 a.m. service. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's a 930. A lot of you probably thought you were coming to the 8 a.m. service. We're thrilled that you're here. Of course, you thought you were coming in late, I guess, but um, or early. Wow. But we're here, and it is the 930, and we made it through time change and snowpocalypse and everything else that did or did not happen. So uh, we are glad. If you're a guest, we are certainly glad that you're here as well. And we would love to ask a favor of you. If you don't mind, at the bottom of your bulletin, the sheet of paper you received as you walked in, uh, there's a thing called a communication card. It tears right off. Would you do us a favor and fill that out? Uh, Certainly, if you have any prayer needs as well, uh, we would love to have a record of your visit, the fact that you were here, uh, and uh, that would be your gift to us. Just drop that in the offering later on in today's service, if you don't mind. Uh, That would be wonderful. Hey, if you're a student, uh, grade 6 through 12, or the parent of said student, uh, you need to know that April 7th through the 9th is our Station Hill Spring Retreat. That is coming up. Registration is now open for that. You can go to our website, stationhillchurch.com, and sign up for that. This is the student event that we do every year that is just Station Hill. Most of ours, we, we love to do with all of the campuses. That's a lot of fun to get together with all the students church wide. But this is a great opportunity for the Station Hill students specifically to grow a community as they go deeper in God's Word uh, in a retreat setting. uh, And it's a great time. Uh, My kids love this particular event. And so you'll want to make your plans uh, to attend that uh, and then certainly go on over to the website and sign up for it today. All right. I think that's got it. So since you're here, let's go ahead and stand up and greet somebody around you. Tell them welcome this morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Let's begin today by reading Psalm 34 together. Would you read with me? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's fill this room this morning with the praises of our God. He's worthy of our songs today. Let's sing together. Praise is rising. Rising eyes are turning to you. We turn to you.
of John, John wrote that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not recorded in this book. But these were written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name.
Lord. Amen. God be praised. You may be seated.
Praise the Lord. It's great to be part of the body of Christ, isn't it? Every time we've uh, been working on that song, I always think back to the, the great hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I'll wholly trust on the wonderful and the beautiful and the powerful name of Jesus. In the book of Ephesians, right at the end of chapter 2, Paul said, now therefore you are no longer uh, you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so what a privilege we have to be part of God's family today and to spend time with Him, fellowshipping with other believers, worshiping Him, coming into this room with, with one purpose, and that's to make much of the name of Jesus. This morning we've got some, some great opportunities to pray, um, great things to pray for and about during our prayer and altar time this morning. Uh, Leanne uh, mentioned to you last week, each month we're gonna begin focusing on an unreached people group um, and, and uh, that you'll be reminded through your bulletin and, and every week during our prayer and altar time. This month we're praying for the Kodakoli people of Togo. You'll see a slide up on the screen. You may wanna you may want to pray eyes open for part of the time this morning. You can read about um, the ministries that are taking place there and the desperate need there is for the gospel to be shared and proclaimed. Um, there's a great truck stop ministry there, and 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 those truckers, are, they have special privileges to go into places that a lot of people can't get into. And so we're, uh, so the gospel is being spread there in West Africa through that incredible ministry. And so pray for those people who are serving and sharing in that way. And also from our own church, we have a team leaving for Kenya this week. That's a long ways away, you know what I'm saying? So we wanna pray for them. They've got a big trip coming ahead and some great opportunities there on the field. And so you may see uh, team members come uh, down to pray. You may just wanna uh, put a hand on one of them and pray for them. You'll see their names up on the screen. And I would just encourage you to, to call their names out to the Lord um, and uh, or even jot them down so you can pray for them while they're traveling, while they're um, uh, serving the Lord on the other side of the planet in the name of the Lord and, and representing uh, us, representing the church at Station Hill. And so great things to pray about this morning. This altar is going to be open. I'd encourage you to take advantage of that. Our pastor is going to be here praying. I know many of you would like to come and pray over him as well. Let's give this service to the Lord today. Let's set our eyes on him and knowing that he has a great plan for our time together this morning. Let's pray together.
Lord, we love you today, and we're grateful uh, just to witness people coming and kneeling before you, um, to see a, a room full of people um, focused uh, with hearts set on you today. Lord, we have so much to pray about. God, we're so grateful for a, a church that recognizes your movement here in this building and here in this community and here in Middle Tennessee, but Lord, uh, sees and, and knows that you're moving and working and saving uh, all across the world and who wants to be a part of that. And so God, we pray for our team this week leaving for Kenya. God, we pray that you'd so be uh, honored and pray for John, Brian, Melanie, Carson, Renee, Georgia, and Sadie. God, we pray that you would uh, so use them. Lord, that, that your purposes and plans are far beyond even their agenda. God, you would exceed every expectation and move in ways that, uh, that they aren't even expecting. God, give great opportunities uh, knowing that they're prevalent uh, there, God, to, to share the gospel and to see lives changed by the power of the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray uh, for uh, uh, West Africa today, specifically the Kodakoli people of Togo. God, we pray that you um, would do such a great work there. God, you you made them and you love them. And so, Lord, I pray that um, the gospel will be um, uh, prevalent in that area, God, in the days ahead, that you will give us uh, open windows of, of greater opportunity than ever before to see Jesus uh, become a, more, a common name there, God, a name that they can say that they've heard and a gospel message that they know, knowing that it will change them forever. So, God, we lift up those people to you. Remind us daily, Lord, to lift up them and, and, and groups all over the world, God, who uh, still have never heard the gospel. So God, do a great work. Thank you for our pastor, his leadership, and I'm so uh, grateful for this uh, new series and so many great takeaways already this morning. I pray that you'll speak through him in this 930 hour. God, we're looking to you today. Jesus Christ, our chief cornerstone, the foundation of, of all that we know and believe, God. Lord, we are looking to you today to do a great work in our time together. So Lord, we give this service to you, set our hearts on you today, and we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Well, amen. Thank you, Cliff and worship team and choir for that time of worship. Uh, he probably couldn't have picked a better Sunday with the lyrics, lift up your head, all you who are weary. Can I get an amen uh, on Time Change Sunday? So, uh, so I'm glad that you guys are here and you made it to be with us. And even if you meant to be here for the eight o'clock service, that's cool. We're not going to tell anybody, okay? Uh, just glad that you're here at 930. Uh, well, today, uh, during this time, we're thinking about our Hope for the World mission offering. And there's a phrase that I want to get into the life of our church, so you're going to hear it often, and it's this. This. It's the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. The light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. If you think about it, if you were going to set up literally a floodlight on the top of our church building and get it to Kenya, where our team is headed next week, if you were going to get it to our other partners in Guatemala or in Nepal or in other parts of our country or even in other parts of our city, that would have to be a super bright light, right? But the closer you were to it here at home, the brighter it would be in order to reach that far. And the same is true of us as followers of Jesus Christ. When we try to get the news out about his wonderful name to the people who have never heard it, the farther it shines, it means it shines even brighter in our hearts here at home. Why? Because we're consciously thinking about the ways that we can pray and give and go and be a part of what God's doing, not just over there, but here in our own hearts as well. 
And so today, as we see these images that are going to be on the screen in just a moment, as we pray for our mission partners, I want to remind you that our Hope for the World mission offering isn't just for Christmas time. It's all year round. As a matter of fact, it helps our partners to not get all just a, a lump sum at one time at the end of the year, uh, but for our giving to be continual to help them as they minister 365 days out of the year to people in some of the darkest corners of the globe. And so your giving makes that possible. So will you join me as, I, as we pray together? as our ushers come forward this morning. Oh, Father, thank you that it has been so good for us to be in this place this morning and sing about the wonderful name of Jesus. God, I pray that the desire of our heart is not to keep that news to ourselves, but, Father, to share it with others, to allow that light to pierce the darkness as far as the four corners of the earth. And so, Father, as we see images of our mission partners and our mission journeys got up on the screen in a few moments, as we reflect on what you're doing in and through our people throughout the world, God, I pray that you will take our tithes and offerings, and just like the little boy with his loaves and fish, God, that as we surrender those things to you, God, that you will use them, that you will multiply our efforts, and that many, many people will see in here that Jesus Christ loves them and that he is Lord and Savior of all. So, Father, bless our time of worship through giving, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the second chapter of the book of Judges. Uh, and I know uh, that's not a book that we always preach and teach out of. Uh, and so uh, it's in the Old Testament. I'll give you a moment or two to find it. Uh, and as you do, I want you to, uh, first of all, just put your hands in the air. Everybody do this, okay? Stretch a little bit, okay? First of all, pat yourself on the back and say, way to go, getting up into church on Time Change Sunday. Okay, good job, you. So you can pat your neighbor if you want to as well. All right, but second of all, I want you to put your hand in the air if you have ever heard a sermon from the book of Judges before, okay? Just put that hand up, okay? All okay, right, I kind of want to see, okay? Okay, great. Okay, keep the hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Now, I want you to put your heads down if that sermon was about Gideon. Okay, if that's the only sermon you've heard from Judges, it was about Gideon. Okay, how about if it was about Samson, hands down as well there. Okay, so what do we have left? About, I think I count maybe a dozen people. Okay, all right, you can put your hands down. Uh, here's the point. 
Sometimes when I'm studying God's word, I love the familiar passages. I love the gospels. Uh, I love the epic stories of the Old Testament. But sometimes it, it's beneficial for us, especially of those who, uh, of, of us who have been in the word for a while, to dive into a passage of scripture that we've probably read before, but we haven't spent a lot of time with. So last summer I did an in-depth study uh, on the book of Judges, uh, and I found it fascinating. Uh, because I think it has so much application for our time. So we're going to spend the next four weeks in the book of Judges. And, and I want to challenge you to read all the way through the book. Of course, we're going to hit some key highlights along the way. We don't have time to teach through the entire book. But it's going to lead us up uh, to Palm Sunday. Uh, and then, of course, to Easter. And so the idea here is that I want to go ahead and tell you what's at the end of the book. Anybody like me, they get a little curious and they want to flip to the last chapter sometimes and see where the book is going. Let me go ahead and tell you the very last book or the very last verse of the book of Judges. It's in Judges 21, 25. It says, and in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Hence the kind of freaky sermon graphic that we have, okay? Uh, it's focused on that idea, right? Your perspective, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Our culture today? As we see the struggle of God's people, the mess that they created and found themselves in, we will find God faithful to hear their cries. We will see God at work even in the middle of some of the darkest times in ancient Israel's history. And I find it very fascinating as just kind of an observer of culture, in television, movies, books these days, the, the, the themes all seem to be dark they're dystopian, they're zombie, apocalyptic something, right? And being a father of four and pastoring a growing church, I don't read or watch much of that stuff, but even a casual observer of our culture notices that many of the themes today that our world is focusing on are dark and darker all of the time. So what is the silver lining in those themes? It's that people, I think, are intuitively looking for the light, and so the book of Judges helps us to understand how the light gets through when things are about as dark as they can be. And it's why it's imperative that we study the whole counsel of God's word. And I think along with me, you're gonna find it fascinating and so applicable and challenging to our lives as we seek to be obedient to God's word in a broken culture. So would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we begin our study by reading from Judges chapter 2, your bulletin on the screen says verses 10 through 15. I'm going to back up uh, and grab verse 8 and 9 as well. So verses 8 through 15 this morning, Judges chapter 2. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnath Harris in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. So the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They infuriated the Lord. For they abandoned him and worshiped Baal and the Ashtoreths. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he handed them over to marauders who raided them. He sold them to the enemies around them, and they could no longer resist their enemies. Whenever, is, whenever the Israelites went out, the Lord was against them and brought disaster on them, just as he had promised and sworn to them. So they suffered greatly. Speak, Lord. For your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Father, we live in a time in which we look all around us at our culture and we see people who are suffering greatly. God, today I pray that through the power of your word we would see the destructive cycle of our sin. I pray, God, that at the same time we would see your hand and your grace, how it moves and how Judges teaches us that we cannot save ourselves from the mess we've created, but that we truly need a savior in an era in which everyone does what is right in their own eyes. So Father, would our eyes be drawn to you through the power of your word today? May we not walk out of here the same people we were when we came. 
So open our eyes, our hearts, and our lives to you in this place. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So you want to keep your Bibles out. And so I'm going to hit you with a lot this morning as we set the table uh, for this series. As we do any time we start a new book study, you need to always ask yourself the good questions. Who wrote this book? About what time was it written? What was the historical context? What was taking place? So that we can pick up where we are in the story. Just like when you see the opening of a movie, you have to try to figure out what's going on. Anytime we dive into a new book of the Bible, we want to ask those kinds of questions. So and we know that as far as the biblical narrative goes, that God's people had now been led by Moses out of the promise, or out of Egypt and to the door step of the promised land. Moses, because of his sin, was not able to go into the promised land, and so that fell to the generation of Joshua uh, to be able to lead God's people, Joshua and Caleb, into the promised land. And so I want to use an illustration in this sermon that's an old preacher illustration. It was made the most famous by Dr. Bruce Wilkinson of Walk Through the Bible Ministries, but it's three chairs or three stools that I have here on the platform. I'm going to put it on the screen for you as well. Because when we think about the history of Israel and what was taking place here, we first, in the first chair, had the committed generation, or the Joshua generation. It says at the beginning of the book of Joshua that as Joshua inherited this mantle of leadership from Moses, it was almost overwhelming, right? And so God told him, be strong and courageous. Three times in Joshua 1, be strong and courageous. The Lord your God is with you. Do not let his book, his word, the book of the law depart from you, but meditate on it day and night. Be strong and courageous. And that fueled God's people as they moved into the promised land. And that first generation, the Joshua generation to inherit the promised land, they saw God do some amazing things. They saw the walls of Jericho come tumbling down as God's people worshiped. It wasn't your typical military strategy, right? To put the singers out in front and to walk around the city, you know, seven times in obedience to God. But God wanted to prove a point that they would not conquer the promised land by their own tactics and strategies. Instead, they would do it in the strength and in the power of God so that the people of that land would know that he was distinct, that he, as we sang about earlier this morning, he alone was the unchangeable, unshakable God of the universe. And so that generation saw the sun stand still. They conquered most of the promised land. But as always, there remained work yet to be done. And so that baton was passed to the next generation. And if you look back at the very beginning of Judges, flip back to chapter 1. You'll see there after Moses' death in chapter 2 that the next stage of Israel's history must take place. And so, in verse 1, who will be the first to fight for us against the Canaanites to continue the work that Joshua had begun? Verse 2, the Lord answered. You see, at this point, Israel had no clear-cut leader. They had Moses, they had Joshua, and now the Lord says, listen to my voice. Let me be your leader. But let's confess and be honest. As humans, we have a hard time with that. We like to look to a person We like to listen to their leadership. And so the Lord says, Judah, the tribe of Judah, is to go. I have handed the land over to him. In other words, the victory is already won and it's secure. Judah, it's time for you to go. Verse 3, Judah says, "Um, not by myself. He says to his brother Simeon, come with me to my territory and let us fight against the Canaanites. Do you see the subtle hint there? That God's people listen to God's words, but instead of full obedience, they started moving just a few degrees off. Well, hey, let's, let's do it our way, right? Okay, God's given us the victory, but hey, instead of obeying his word, let's say, hey, two tribes are better than one, right? Doesn't that make sense to us as human beings? It does. But again, that wasn't the point. God wanted and expected full obedience from his people. And so we begin to see, chair number two, the story of complacency and compromise among his people. It deepens by the time we get to verse 19. The Lord was with Judah and enabled them to take possession of the hill country. Again, the emphasis here on the Lord and what he had done. So when he enables them to take possession of the hill country, but... They could not drive out the people who were living in the valley because those people had what? Iron chariots. 
For that day and age, that was techno te uh, technological advancement, right? To have not only a chariot, but a chariot made of the strength of iron. And so in essence, what the people said is, the Lord, we, we can't drive them out. They're, they're technologically superior to us. Their fighting forces are better than we are. You see, the people looked at their situation, but they forgot how great their God was in that moment. And so they did not drive them out completely. Look at verse 21. At the same time, the Benjamites did not drive out the Jebusites. If you go a little bit farther in the text, you'll see in verse 27, at that time, Manasseh failed to take possession of Beth Shean. Verse 29, at that time, Ephraim failed to drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulun failed to drive out the residents of Ketron. If you go on down to verse 32, you see the Asherites are actually now living among the Canaanites, making peace with the people there, and they failed to drive them out. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the residents of Beth Shemesh, and they lived among the Canaanites. Verse 34, the Amorites forced the Danites into the hill country. So now it's the Canaanites who are forcing God's people, telling them where they are supposed to go, when it's God's people who are supposed to take the land. But this story... Chapter 1 is really about how the land started taking hold of God's people. And so the result is, of course, when you don't drive out these nations, is that you start looking around at your neighbors. You start paying attention to their culture. God's people are always supposed to be the thermostat, the ones who set the temperature in the culture. But instead, they became thermometers moving according to the culture that was around them. Instead of them being the ones to have the influence, they were being the ones influenced. And so a great illustration that one commentator says is that what happened was these idols, these pagan ways of worship, became like buried landmines. We'll put up a picture of that on the screen. Some of you have traveled or you've read the stories or heard about this. I've been in the Middle East several times and I've seen fields with signs just like this. Danger, mines. Past conflict, minds have been left behind. And now the danger is, of course, you walk across that field, you don't know where they're at. They explode and they maim you. The United Nations estimates that between 15 and 20,000 people every year lose their lives uh, in minefields just like this one. Tragically, half of them children who just went out to the field to play. And the same devastating effect happens when we look at the culture around us and we compromise with it. If you think about the time that we live in, the New Testament era, we know that the victory has already been won on the cross, that Jesus has defeated sin and death forever, and yet in our culture remains these minds that the enemy has left to distract, to discourage, and to wound God's children. That's what happens when we become complacent and we compromise with the culture. And so it's interesting, isn't it? We get to the end of chapter one and we realize that there's actually two introductions in Judges. Chapter one is kind of the historical military introduction. And in that, it's almost as if the author is kind of teasing us, baiting us a little bit into feeling kind of sorry for the Israelites. You know, we have the spin rooms today, right? where politicians or commentators will get up and they will try to put their spin on things. And that's almost exactly what it seems to be, uh, seems to be happening in the way that the events of chapter one are being laid out. Don't you feel sorry for the Israelites? I mean, this conquering the promised land stuff, that's hard work, isn't it? I mean, to drive out these people completely, I mean, can't we just all get along and just kind of settle down and live side by side and just kind of figure it out as we go? I mean, after all, they have... Iron chariots, people, right? So we can't drive them out completely. It's fascinating to turn to chapter two and see God's perspective because chapter two is the spiritual introduction to the book of Judges. And if I can find my Bible, put it on this stool. I always put it on that stool, so through me for a little bit. Chapter two gives us that perspective. Beginning of chapter two, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal. Wait a minute, angels live in Gilgal? Here's the intentionality behind that statement. If you go back in the book of Joshua, Gagal was the place that God's people had made a promise to him. They had made a promise to him that they would obey him fully and serve him only. And so that's there as a reminder to us. 
God says, remember the last time you talked to me, you made a promise? Now the angel of the Lord comes up from Gigal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and I led you into the land I had promised your fathers. I also said, I will never break my covenant or my promise with you. You are not to make a covenant with the people who are living in the land and you are to tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. You hear chapter one, the Israelites saying, God, we can't. Do you hear what God is saying in chapter two? It's because you won't. You see, when God calls for obedience, he will never set us up for failure. He is true to his word every time. And even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when we don't understand it, our God, the God of the big picture, does. And so when he calls you to obedience, he calls you to full obedience, or consequences will result. The natural consequence of your decision to not drive them out means this, verse three. Therefore, I now say, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your side. Tim Keller says this about this illustration. He says, this is a very illuminating description of what idolatry is and does. You see, idolatry is taking often a good aspect of creation. For example, your marriage or the mountains, the outdoors, creation, your business and your achievements, so on. But you make that into the ultimate source of security, identity, and power. So false gods are a thorn. When we make something into an idol, it continually makes us miserable. You might want to write that down because it is so true. When we take a good thing and we try to make it an ultimate thing, that thorn, that idol continually makes us miserable. We look to it for life, but it cannot give us life. It only takes life. He says this, if we fall short of it, or if we even might fall short of it, it robs us of our joy. So there are a lot of us who live a joyless, unhappy existence. Why? Because we are pursuing something, trying to look for life in it, and it will never give us life back. For example, he says, if our children are our false god, when their lives become troubled, we will lose our joy. Or even when their lives might become troubled, which is all the time. Can I get an amen, parents? We will worry, and we will lose our joy. In that way, idols become thorns to us. Not only thorns, what else does he say they are? The gods will be a trap or a snare to you, to where they have control of your life. The addictions, the temptations that you fall prey to, these kind of things. I can't get out of it. Why? Because it has ensnared you. You have allowed it into your life to the point that it's got you. So when the angel of the Lord had spoken these words to all the Israelites, the people wept loudly. Why? Because they realized the result of what they had done. And they realized that God was not going to make it easy on them. Like a loving parent, he was going to make sure that they continually were looking to him. He was not going to make it easy and remove the peoples and the idols of that land. Instead, the people were now, because of their disobedience, going to have to live among those idols. Just like in our culture, we have to live with all of the idols that are all around us. And now for most of us, when we think about these Old Testament times, it's tempting to think, well, I'm not tempted to bow down to something carved of wood or stone. Oh no, brothers and sisters. Our idols are much more deceptive, aren't they? They're things that we call achievement, or career, or money, or popularity, or success. You see, our idols are much more deceptive, but they take hold of us in the same way. After all, our culture says these are the things that define you. These are the things that make you somebody. Well, look at the result of what happens when you've got a generation that has been complacent, that has allowed those things to coexist alongside of them. Look at what happens next, verse 10. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord, nor the works he had done for Israel. So now you have a generation, chair three, that is in conflict. 
is in direct conflict. So what happened, the Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and they abandoned the Lord, the very God who had rescued them as a people out of Egypt. What devastating words. It says a few verses later, they worship the Baals and the Ashtoreths, okay, which is a word for the Greek goddess Arstarte. And so you begin to get this picture, much like we have in our culture. It's not that the Israelites said, no more Yahweh, we're going after Baal. No, it's that they compromised. And so they began to do a mix and match religion in which they tried to pull different pieces from both the religion they had inherited from their forefathers, the worship of Yahweh, but also the worship of these Canaanite gods. And I have been there to Israel. I have seen their altars. I have heard the terrible stories about what happened around those altars. I cannot repeat them in mixed company in church. They were an evil people, and that God particip- God's people participated in that kind of worship is devastating. And so you have a generation that now is completely broken. And the rest of this passage goes on to tell us about this cycle of sin that they found themselves in. And as a pastor who ministers to people every week, I can tell you that every sin puts us on a cycle of some kind unless it is broken by the gospel. I wanna put that cycle up on the screen for you because I wanna walk us through it for a few moments this morning because it lays the groundwork for the rest of this series. What happens, number one, it begins always when we rebel. When God says, here's the way, and we're like, no, thank you, I'm gonna go my own way. I'm gonna do things my way. And that's exactly what the people had done. Number two, God is angry, the text tells us. Now, let's be careful here, okay, because God is not us. And when we get angry, we're tempted to think God's angry in the way that we're angry. Not so. God's anger is always righteous. It is always holy. God is angry about the brokenness and the evil and the sin in this world. And he's angry because he knows he did not create his children to live in that broken state that he wants a restored relationship with them. And so it it angers him, his holy hatred against sin and evil. And so he allows, like a good father, discipline to take place. And so he hands the people over to their enemies. He, in essence, says, have it your way. Go ahead. If you don't want me, then see how that works out for you. And they are oppressed by their enemies. And guess what happens? They're overwhelmed. And it's unfortunate that it takes this as human beings for God to get our attention so many times. But as C.S. Lewis says, pain is often God's megaphone. It's the only way that we will listen. And so, number four, the people finally cry out. Lord, save us. We've made a mess of things. We're in a disastrous position. I'll be blunt. This is sometimes when I see people coming back to church, right? So... We've made a mess of our lives. Will you help us? Things get better, and we don't see them again for a while. Why? Because it's that mix and match religion. I'm coming to God to try to fix things, to make things right, to get what I want. But God is so gracious that his grace abounds, even to those who are on this cycle over and over again. Number five, God sends salvation. The people cannot save themselves. So he sends a judge a person that he raises up to rescue the people. But as we'll see as the series goes on, the story is not primarily about the judges. Some of you may have grown up in Sunday school and you kind of heard these people, you know, Gideon and Samson and these guys as biblical heroes. I want to tell you something. They're not. They're not. The story is about the God who raises up the judge to save the people. Because human judges can only save some of the people some of the time. And as you see the cycle and the downward spiral continue, you will see in the book of Judges how each period of peace, which is what follows, is shorter than the period before. And then what happens? The judge dies, and the people go back to even greater rebellion than when they did before. It's like when you're in school and you had a substitute teacher, right? So you were on your worst behavior. Human nature hasn't changed in all of these millennia. It's still the same. So I know you're like, whoa, this is heavy, especially for Time Change Sunday. So what do we do with this? Here's our three takeaways today. Takeaway number one is this. Half-hearted obedience to God is no obedience at all. There's a lot of us who think half-hearted discipleship is the way to go, that I'll go through the motions, that I will play the church game. Remember, 
You had the Joshua generation committed to the Lord and what only he could do through them, not what they could manufacture, but what only he could do. But what happens in generation number two, they grow complacent and they begin to compromise with the culture. And I'll be blunt, if you wanna know why the church in in America is so weak, it's because I believe that we have compromised with our culture. We have tried half-hearted obedience, halfway discipleship. I want to tell you that God will not stand for it. And so some of the reason that we're in and the culture we're in is because we have failed to be salt and light, as Jesus called us to be in our culture. We have failed to be distinctive ambassadors of the grace and mercy and hope of what only God can do. This is not the seat that we want to sit in. And not only that, parents, grandparents, see what happens in just a couple of generations. You have a generation, Deuteronomy 6, that Moses commanded. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Have no other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This command is to be upon your heart. Impress this into your children. And somewhere between generation one and generation two, the gospel was confused. And so you get to generation three, and the gospel is lost. It's why what you do, the way you live, the choices you make about the idols in our culture matter. The way that you spend your money and your time, the entertainment you allow into your home, all of these things are forging and shaping something in the next generation. And oh, this generation may know how to play the church game. They may know how to show up at Easter and Christmas. They may know how to you know, find the book of Judges in their Bible. But if it's not impressed upon their heart, if they are not committed and faithful and completely obedient, then we find the next generation in the same predicament that this generation did. Takeaway number two is this. Judges teaches us that despite appearances to the contrary, God is always in control. That God is always in control. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's some stuff in the book of Judges that is dark and hairy and scary. I bet you guys will be all, man, quickly in your Bible tomorrow morning during your quiet time trying to find it, right? Because nothing says, you know, hey, I wanna go read this. Like, hey, don't read this, right? It's really freaky. So no, I want you to read it because I want you to lean into the fact that when culture goes as haywire as it can, when things get as dark as they could possibly be, that God is still there that he is still very much at work. And as we will see, the end of the book of Judges, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes points us to the fact that we cannot rescue and save ourselves. Why have we called this series The Gospel According to Judges? It's because of the gospel truth that we have to turn away from our sin and ourselves to the just and gracious creator God who loved us so much that he sent his own son to die on the cross for us, who was raised from the dead to conquer sin and death forever so that by turning from our sin and ourselves, we could be reconciled to God forever. Judges points that out, that there's no human hero that can rescue us. Only God and his grace alone can do that. Which brings us to our third takeaway this morning, and that's that we all need to be honest, that we all sit in one of these three chairs, and all three need a savior to deliver us. I know it's tempting to say, well, I'm the committed one, right? I mean, after all, pastor, I'm at church on Times Change Sunday, right? Surely that proves that I'm the committed one. Well, guess what? For those of you who love the gospel, who love the Lord, We need to remember every day that we've got to preach the gospel to ourselves, that we've got to put on the armor, that we have a role and responsibility to be as ambassadors of grace and peace and love in our broken world. We too need the gospel every day. But I think the reality, far more of us sit in this chair, the chair in which we walk in our broken culture, and we're so tempted to look at the idols that are all around us, and we give our lives away to those idols those things that we think will bring us dignity or worth or purpose or meaning, and they don't. They let us down every time. So my prayer this week has been that in the power of the gospel today, you would see the idols that are like landmines in your life, 
whether that's addictions, whether that's pornography, whether that's relationships, whether that's your career or success, whatever it is that you would see that idol and that you would ask the Lord Jesus Christ to detonate it, to smash it, so that you will not compromise or be complacent any longer. Why? Because there is a generation, a world of darkness that is broken and hurting, that desperately needs to know the truth. A generation that is in direct conflict to God. Why? Because they don't know the way, they don't know the truth, and someone has to share that with them. They need the gospel. So what do you do when you live in a culture in which everyone does what is right in their own eyes? You ask God to see through his. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response and commitment? I know I've thrown a lot at you today, but like I said, this is so applicable for our world and our lives today. Which chair do you sit in today? What is your need for the gospel? As I've said, all three chairs, all of us, the answer is the same, Jesus. Jesus is the God who came to us in our brokenness when we could not get to him. And so today, how do you need to respond to the true king? Israel looked for the answer in other human beings. The answer could not be found, and they just descended further and further into their brokenness. We, you and I, the good news has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And today, if you're willing to turn from your sin and yourself, he is there to be your rightful king to love you, and by his grace to save you. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're so honest, that you preserve even the darkest times of the history of your people for us so that we can learn. So, Father, would we respond today to a grace, a grace that is greater than our sin, a grace that's greater than the brokenness and the cycles that we find ourselves caught in, Today, Father, would we know the truth and would the truth of Jesus Christ set us free? And it's in his name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Stand with us and sing these words this morning. We all have a need, and the answer is the same. His name is Jesus, and he's here, and he invites you to respond to him today. In just a few moments, I'm gonna be down front. Our decision counselors are coming now. They're gonna be in my right and my left, so there are plenty of people for you to talk and pray with. If you need to know the God, the God who loves you, the God who came for you in the person of Jesus, that's why we're here, and we invite you to respond today.
If you're a guest with us, we're honored and blessed that you've been here. Brian, Brandon, some of our team are at the back. They'd love to tell you more about the life of our church, how you can get plugged in and connected. But let's respond to the God who came to us when we could not get to him. And let's go this week to live in full obedience to his loving commands. Amen? Amen. You are loved and you are dismissed. Have a great Sunday.